What is an ETF? How do ETFs compare to mutual funds and index funds? And how would you go about investing in an ETF? Answers to all of these questions and more coming up. Hello and welcome to Practical Personal Finance, where you get the information you need to understand and succeed with money. Today, we'll be covering the basics of exchange-traded funds, more commonly known as ETFs, and I'll be joined by Josh Olfert. Josh is a Certified Financial Planner, or CFP, from Manitoba, Canada, who just loves seeing that light bulb go on in someone's head when they begin to understand the impact investing can have on their life. He's been featured in Business Insider's Top 20 Under 20 in Finance, and at one point, he was the youngest CFP in all of Canada. In his free time, Josh enjoys golfing, practicing Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and making videos for his YouTube channel. And now, without any further delay, here's my conversation with Josh Olfert. Josh, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today and share some of your knowledge and expertise with all of us. I know our topic today is going to be ETFs, so let's start out with the most basic question of all. What is an ETF? Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me, Andrew. This is so much fun. And whenever I get a chance to talk about investing or something like ETFs with people, that's just great. It's just exciting for me. And I think that in order to really understand what an ETF is, if you're okay with this, I want to help people understand why do ETFs exist quickly. And if you talk with a lot of these uh, thought leaders in entrepreneurship or business or talking about wealth and wealth management, financial planning, a lot of people will come to the same conclusion. And it's that we have a massive problem in, uh, across the states in North America, many countries, is that we have, we have a wealth inequality problem. And we have you know, a large portion of the wealth that's concentrated in the hands of fewer people. And a lot of people agree that if we want to kind of solve that problem, it starts from the ground up and you need to have people understand the difference between labor and capital. When you have labor, what you're doing is you're trading your time away for money and you're going to work, you know, your 40 hours a week in a job. And hey, maybe you love that job. But if you never actually start to in earn income from assets rather than your labor, it's really tough to get ahead. And that's the reason we have wealth inequality. People who end up switching out their labor for capital instead, they earn income from rental properties or shares of companies like stocks or something like an ETF, which we'll talk about, those people tend to do really well. And we need to be educating people on how they can get involved in the world of capital and rental markets and investing and ETFs and these sorts of things. So what, what an ETF is, to come back to your question, is it is the most accessible way for the average person to access the world of the stock market or the world of investing. And it's the easiest way for a new investor to get a professionally diversified quality portfolio of investments that they don't really have to be brilliant in terms of investing in terms of investing to achieve or acquire or buy. An ETF is really just a structure that allows you to invest in tons of different companies without actually having to do your research on each individual company. It's a great way to just own the stock market in general. So most of us are familiar with the concept of buying stock in a single company. How is the concept of buying an ETF similar and at the same time different from buying a stock? That is a fantastic question. And there are a lot of similarities. Like there's a, the, the reason that ETFs have become popular is because they're becoming more and more like stocks. And really what a stock is, as, as most of us know, is it's a share in a company right? But if we put all of our money into just one company, we hold a lot of risk because the odds that, you know, any given company, you know, we take something like GameStop, for instance, has crazy volatility. The odds are pretty high that one company has a lot of volatility or a lot of risk in it. But if we diversify across 10 different companies, instead of just owning one business, if we own 10, that risk goes down dramatically. And the more companies you invest in, the more your risk kind of goes down. That kind of levels off around 50. But if you own more stocks, it's less risk. That's what an ETF is. Instead of owning an individual stock, you're buying into a basket. You're buying into a basket of pre-selected holdings from some manager, and we'll get there. But it's a pre-selected basket of stocks. So you don't have to put all of your money into one bet. 
you can spread it across many things that really brings the volatility down. So that's the difference. That's why it's not a stock because it's a collection of investments in one single thing that you can buy at one time. The reason it's similar to a stock is that it actually trades on an exchange. And that's why well, that's called an ETF because it's an exchange traded fund. What that means is it's, it's a fund of investments that you can buy and sell on the market just like you would with a stock. So that is my explanation for what is kind of similar and different about them. Now, have ETFs been around forever or are they relatively new? Oh, that's a great question. I would say ETFs only became extremely popular in the last decade or two. And they, they started as kind of an appendage of what's called index investing. A lot of people over the last let's say 30 years, or maybe even 20 years, have come to realize that the entire world of active traders, people who are trying to buy and sell stocks to beat the market, people have come to realize theoretically and, and practically that all of those people who are trying to beat the market are fighting over the same pool of outperformance, if that makes sense. Not everybody can beat the average because everybody acting together is average. And what investors and active managers are trying to do is beat the stock market average. But if there's a hundred active managers, half of them are going to beat it and half of them aren't going to beat it. So it's kind of a losing battle over time to be fighting over this finite pool of like excess return. So the reason that ETFs got super popular is people realized, okay, I don't really have to be all that sharp in terms of the markets. I can own an ETF that holds the entire stock market and I'm going to benefit from being an investor in every single company just by buying one thing. So ETFs probably in the 80s and 90s were just in their very beginnings. And over the past 10 or 20 years, they've taken over the world by storm, especially in America. In America, ETFs are a mass majority of, of financial products used now. And I would say that that would, that, that would be the, the case. The history is it's only exploded recently, but they've been around for quite some time. What are some of the different types of ETFs that are out there? Oh man, there's thousands. I think, I think the last time I did the research on this, there were six or 7,000 ETFs out there. And one thing you need to know is that the way ETF companies and investment management companies make money is when assets flow into those funds and assets by, I mean, investor dollars like yours and mine and all of your listeners, when they buy an investment, assets flow into that fund. And the ETF managers make money as a percentage of the dollars in there. So yes, ETF started off as this great idea where we can access the markets, but it quickly became a profit center for big companies. How can we find a way to make as many niche ETFs as possible so that we can drive as much marketing interest as possible so we can get the most dollars into these ETFs? So to answer the question, once these investment management companies in Wall Street realized there was a profit opportunity and there was a money-making opportunity ETFs, they exploded and they include everything now. You can own just the American market or you can own Vietnamese small cap stocks. You can, you can own only things that are like highly speculative growth companies. One that's gotten really popular is called ARK Investments. They're holding things like Tesla and making plays in Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. ETFs, there are so many of them that they literally expand the entire universe of investing. And you could find an ETF for just about anything. How do ETFs compare to index funds or mutual funds which have been around for a longer period of time? ETFs are really an evolution out of index funds. And index funds comes back to that idea I was talking about previously about how if we just buy the total stock market index, let's say like the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones or whatever it might be, you get access to what we could consider as most of the entire American market. Now, at first, index funds were built in a mutual fund package. And if you're not really sure what the difference is between an ETF and a mutual fund, and uh, do you ever remember going to Blockbuster to rent movies? If you remember going to Blockbuster to rent movies and now we have Netflix, you could almost think of it this way. Before we used to go, we would go to the store, we would try to find our movie, it would be really impossible. Someone had usually taken it out already. And then if by some crazy chance we found the movie we wanted, we would go put it on the counter and it'd be like 16 bucks or something crazy. We'd go rent it and then we'd have to bring it back and put it back in the slot. And it was all analog and manual. And then along comes Netflix, which is all the movies you ever want. It doesn't matter if anybody else is watching them. You have infinite access and it's nine bucks a month, not per movie. It's way cheaper. It's way easier to use. It's way more technologically advanced. That's how I would compare mutual funds to ETFs. Mutual funds are just the way that we had done 
structured investing in terms of a product that you could buy a whole portfolio with. That's what a mutual fund was. And that's how they got really popular. Over time, they realized, well, the way we structure mutual funds, there's a lot of expenses, there's a lot of administration, uh, there's a lot of analog processes that can't be automated. But what ETFs did is they came along and they streamlined this whole idea of investing in some sort of uh, diversified product. And that's kind of what ETFs are. They're a more advanced version of what mutual funds were. Over the past decade, ETFs have started to become really popular. What do you think is behind that surge in popularity? Oh, I mean, the biggest thing that is really hard to debate is if you take any compound interest calculation, okay? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of ballpark some figures here, but let's say someone's contributing 500 bucks a month to their investment plan and they wanna do that over the course of their career. 500 bucks is like $6,000 a year. And if you do $6,000 a year times, let's say 40 years, that gets you about 240 grand. So you're at a quarter million bucks. If you invest that instead at a rate of let's say eight or 9%, you might end up with more like $2.4 million. You might end up 10Xing the money that you would have had if you saved just by investing in something that will actually grow. There will be more volatility, but it's gonna grow much larger. Now, something interesting to note is if that, the fees that you pay to invest reduce your return, because let's say I have a 9% rate of return, but the mutual fund or the investment fund I'm using takes a 2% fee. That means net to me at the end of the day, I only get 7%. So that might seem not that big of a deal, like to go from 9% to 7%. But what you'll find is if you crunch those numbers is that you end up with way less money if you have a 7% return instead of a nine. So what we found over time is that investment fees are actually one of the number one killers of performance. And what ETFs allow people to do is have a mutual fund type investment, that's a diversified portfolio, but for an insanely low fee. And when I say insanely low, I mean not 2%, but 0.2% or 0.02%. So investing $1,000, you might only have to pay $2 per year to have that ETF, like it's insanely low cost. And I think that's one of the big reasons why they've exploded in popularity. How would someone go about investing their money in an ETF? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say that there's always two options. There's the do it yourself approach, which has become so unbelievably easy. You know, you guys, we, we've all heard about this Robin Hood fiasco and maybe the fact that investing is becoming too accessible. It's almost like too many people have access to it because of what's been going on. but. You can open a brokerage account. It's as simple as that. You can open a brokerage account if you wanna go the do-it-yourself route and you can kind of research. And this is kind of where I don't wanna to give too much advice on what ETFs people should be buying or how, but the, at the end of the day, you wanna read up, do your research, find out what asset allocation, what that means is what types of investments do I wanna own? What countries do I wanna invest in? Do I wanna be in stocks or bonds or real estate? You gotta come up with an idea for a portfolio and how you wanna manage it. But once you've got that down, you can essentially search up on Google, it's as easy as that, and find you know real estate ETF or Vanguard stock market ETF. And each of those ETFs will have a ticker. Um, the Vanguard total stock market is VTI. So these things all have their own tickers. So you open up your brokerage account, you go type in the ticker, and it's easy as clicking buy. <laughs> like it's that simple. Another route you could go is get a financial advisor, right? And I mean, this isn't a sales pitch, but a lot of people even if they don't want to have all their money invested with somebody where they're paying a fee, it might not be a terrible idea to have a portion of your money with a, a professional where you know that they've done this a thousand times. They've seen the ropes before. They've done this over and over and it means they're more comfortable and they're, they can maybe carry out this process easier than you can. So I would say those are the two options. You can go DIY, open up a Robinhood or a brokerage account and do it that way or get a professional, get an advisor. Is there a minimum amount of money you need to get started with investing in ETFs? Well, this is one of the massive breakthroughs. Like we have certain partners that we work with in terms of investment management where clients can only get in there if they have half a million dollars. Like that's the minimum. But with this technology and the way that ETFs scale, it's incredible how the minimums have kind of vanished. Whereas before you would need at least a couple thousand bucks, maybe five or $10,000 back in the 80s or 90s to get into a mutual fund, you can now get into an ETF for $50. Like, and I think there are some that might even have less, but it's, it's insane. The, the, the minimums are almost so low that they don't even play a factor. Are there any fees for buying or selling ETFs that I should keep in mind? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, should you really be focused on fees in your ETFs? Sure. 
but is it the biggest the reason you're buying etfs in the first place is because you're going for low fee and if you're going to find some etf the reality is is that the fee is probably competitive enough that you've done your job there i mean sure to some degree you want to maybe compare etfs and see which is cheaper but i don't think you really have to think too hard about the fees on an etf that's the reason you're looking at it in the first place even given that a lot of brokerages allow you to buy and sell etfs for free so for a stock you might pay four or five dollars a trade a lot of brokers make etf buying and selling completely free the one thing you do want to think about with an etf is something called tracking error and now this is a little more advanced um, but your listeners might enjoy hearing a little bit more about what dynamics or what they want to really monitor when looking at an etf and every etf is compared to some benchmark or it's measured against some benchmark and it's trying to track that benchmark so for instance if the s p does the s p 500 index does 10 percent this year and your etf that's supposed to track that only did nine percent that means you have a one percent tracking error and so what you need is you need to find a fund that has consistently low tracking error and what that allows you to do is make sure that you've got a fund that's reaching its goals or achieving its mandate that it set out to meet. So Josh, what do you think the future looks like for ETFs? Do you think they're going to continue to surge in popularity or is it going to level off? Oh, that's uh yeah, no, I would say that this is just the beginning in terms of where, where technology is going to go for investing. And I think one of the most fascinating movements right now is something called direct indexing. And right now we have stock market indexes. I've mentioned them over and over Dow Jones, S and P, but these are pre-selected by a committee. So a committee at the S and P 500 pre-selects what companies go in there. And you may have heard news this year of like Tesla got included in the S and P it's a committee that has a bunch of rules and they decide what companies go in there. The day will come where we have something called direct or custom indexing, which allows any person to take the in total stock market index and customize what they want or don't want. The reason that might be exciting is someone who works in energy or oil and gas or somebody who works in technology, their income, their salary, their living comes from that industry. It comes from oil or it comes from, from technology. So if their investments are overexposed to technology, they have way too much risk in that area. So what someone who's in tech could do is own the entire stock market index minus technology. That way they're not so over diversified to just that one segment. So you might also think, ah, you know, I'd love this whole investing idea, but I don't like what Exxon Mobil is doing to the environment, or I don't like what uh, these um, alcohol companies are doing to people or gambling, gaming companies. You can go into the S&P 500 and remove gaming or remove oil and gas or remove arms manufacturers. So you're gonna to get to the point where you can take a great portfolio that's diversified and customize it exactly based on rules the way you want your index to be. Um, and that's fascinating. I think that's one of the coolest things coming in, in the future of investing. Is there anything else you think our listeners need to know about ETFs? I think that it's super important that your listeners learn about asset allocation. What uh, David Swenson, he was the um, endowment fund manager, essentially the manager for all of the investing and the endowment fund at Yale. And he did a study and roughly he came out with uh, a result of, if we look at an investor's lifetime of their investing performance, a lot of people think, oh, should I buy Nike or should I buy Under Armour? Or should I buy Netflix or should I buy Google? That's not that important of a question. The bigger question is how much of my pie is gonna be in stocks versus bonds versus real estate? And trying to figure out how to customize the asset allocation, the selection of different categories of assets that you wanna own, that's actually gonna make up 90% of your lifetime investment return as opposed to picking the right stock. Picking the right stock over the long haul only makes up 5% of your lifetime investing return and the other 5% is timing. Do you buy high and sell low or do you buy low and sell high? Asset allocation is the most important thing. And if you want to learn more about ETFs and self-managing your portfolio, you have to understand it. Josh, once again, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show today and for sharing some of your knowledge and expertise with all of us. If anyone would like to learn more from you, where can they find you? Absolutely. Well, I'm Josh Olfert on YouTube and you can go over to YouTube right now and search me up and hit subscribe and follow along there. We'll be releasing a ton of videos in terms of you know, budgeting, personal finance, investing, and what you've done, Andrew, is incredible. And I look forward to following up your story and seeing where your channel goes as well. I want to thank my friend Josh Olfer for taking the time to answer my questions about ETFs. Do you have any other questions that we didn't cover? 
let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, click here to check out Josh's channel. And for more great content just like this, click right here to subscribe to Practical Personal Finance. As always, thanks for watching. I'm Andrew Shear, and I'll see you next time.